Oh, but sorry about the Instagram connection being. It's not gonna work. Flaky. We we have fifty people in there, and it's yeah. not gonna work. Can't believe it. Honestly, <laughs> can't believe it. we're on YouTube, aren't we too? <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Okay, well, uh, let me try one more time, okay? All right. Let's see if this works. Um. All right. We are now recording for like the fifth time today. <laughs> we're gonna see if this works. Thank you everybody for being so patient with us. We really do appreciate it. Well, right. it kicks everyone out, I think, once we... Yeah. Hi again. Hello, everybody. This is our final attempt to go live on Valentine's Day on Instagram because the connection has not been working, but fingers crossed that we are now connected. My name is Julian. Hello, I'm Jeneline. We have Jeneline. And uh, if you're joining us for the very first time, Welcome. This is our weekly Monday morning introduction to philosophy and theory class. This week, we're going to be talking about Zizek's take on Marx, the commodity fetish, Valentine's Day, <laughs> etc. Um, I just want to very briefly say that we are so grateful that you are here this morning. It is such a pleasure to start the week with like-minded individuals around the world, people who believe in this kind of theory and thought and who have this very wholesome community together with us, mm. which we like to call the learning community. So I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart how important it is to me that you are here, that you are sharing the space with us, and that every single week when life gets hard, I think to myself, the Monday morning class is really what makes it worthwhile. That I get such tremendous, such tremendous inspiration from getting to spend this hour um, with you. I really, really do. And mm -hmm. I, find, I find the world to be an unlovable place. <laughs> But I enjoy this hour that we shared together. So I want to say thank you for that. And thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. And I think we should simply um, appreciate each other yes. this morning. And this is how we like to start our week. Sometimes we think, why did we decide first thing on a Monday morning? <laughs> but we're always grateful. And I, and I know and I respect the fact that all of you come into these classes from different countries, mm -hmm. different backgrounds. Some of you have had a good week. Some of you have had a bad week. Some of you are going through your own struggles, your own trials and tribulations. And I hope that you find an hour of solace <laughs> here with us in which you can enjoy uh, breathing what Hannah Arendt once called the fresh air of philosophical thought. <laughs> that, is our, that is our goal here today. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, I just want to very briefly say that uh, we have an ebook. Jenlene edited it, mm -hmm. I wrote it. Mm -hmm. And that um, if you'd like to get the full. I don't know, if you'd like to get everything out of our classes, then consider reading the ebook. The ebook will yes. give you a lot of the background knowledge for the terms that we use in these classes. Mm -hmm. um, also, shout out to Matthias in the <laughs> comment section. Very nice to see you, uh, fellow content creator. Um, so I think we should just start. However, Jenlene has a little PSA regarding comments. I do. Oh, let us know where you're joining us from. <laughs> <laughs> this is all deja vu. Yeah. yeah, we love imagining the sunny or wintry places, as the case may be, where you are tuning in from. It uh, cheers us up. <laughs> it cheers us up a lot. So please do leave us a comment letting us know where you're joining us from. That's really, really nice for us to know. And it makes us feel very connected with everybody around the world. Yeah, and in fact, we are going to be in a new location next week. We're going to be in Seattle. That's right. So we're looking forward to going to some bookstores. That'll be good. <laughs> love from India, love from Argentina, Buenos Aires. Greetings back to you. Mm -hmm. um, we're sending love and big hugs from a chilly parking lot in Spokane, <laughs> Washington. <laughs> uh, Nepal, that's incredible. Pakistan, wonderful. Okay, let's simply dive in. Today yes. is Valentine's Day. We can all sort of collectively roll our eyes and groan <laughs> because uh, there's a German expression which is that uh, people enjoy things with their fists tucked into their pockets. And if there ever was a holiday that people <laughs> enjoy with their fists tucked into their pockets, it is Valentine's Day. Because as much as we want to genuinely express our love and affection for our loved ones, we also know that love has become a valuable commodity and that the idea of showing your love by means of... Um, exchanging goods mm -hmm. instead of exchanging affection or a means of exchanging affection has become increasingly popular. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today, about the commodity fetish, about the idea of Valentine's Day. It's sort of funny because when I was a kid, I don't know if this is still true in the United States, but when I was a kid, I briefly went to school in America and there was a tradition where for Valentine's Day, the, the teachers were very afraid that there would be inequality, at least inequality when it came to romance. <laughs> 
But they couldn't have the children just have an orgy, obviously. <laughs> and so what the what the teachers did was they said that every child had to bring a Valentine's Day card for every other child in yes. the class. Is that still? Oh, yes. Is that, that a is practice? That is a thing. You cannot. I mean, you could give selective Valentines, but you had to give a Valentine to everyone in the class. Right. This is yes. It's it's very interesting. I think it's probably still the case, yeah. There's another German expression. It's from Goethe, where he says, uh, uh, "Besser Unrecht als Unordnung," mm. which means better to have injustice than chaos. <laughs> and I feel like that's the American approach to schools and Valentine's Day. It's like the injustice of not being able to express your affection properly, <laughs> yes. but at least there's like orderly <laughs> affection. Everybody expresses equal amounts of affection. Well, there was a joke that like if if someone writes you a love sonnet, then they really love you. But if they write you 300 love sonnets, then they just really love sonnets. And I feel like that's <laughs> yeah. that way about Valentine's. If someone gives if someone gives out a Valentine, they really love you. But if they give out, you know, 30 Valentines to everyone in the class, then they just really they love, love Valentine's. Valentine's. <laughs> this is a very good observation because I think what happens, and I, and I don't mean to judge here, is that it's, there's, Freud already knew this, for, and everybody who knows Freud knows this, that the idea of child sexuality is very terrifying to people. <laughs> and the only way to neuter the possibility of child sexuality, in other words, the idea that children would have courtly love for their neighborly <laughs> child, is to simply universalize it. To say, instead of having a particular expression of love between mm -hmm. two people, two children, we're going to have a universal expression of love, mm -hmm. which means that instead of loving another child, you are now loving love itself. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes an affirmation of love and gift giving for everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, I also went to school in the Netherlands, in Holland, in Utrecht. And in Holland, they have a very different approach. <laughs> it's, it's not nearly as wild as you think. But the approach in Holland was that you could purchase with the, the students would organize a sale of roses and you could purchase a rose for somebody. Hmm. And then the rose would be delivered to your <laughs> Valentine. But here's the crucial thing during class. <laughs> so the class would be interrupted and the roses would be distributed. Now, of course, this is like actually more cruel than just a regular <laughs> Valentine because instead of an exchange of affection, it's a very public exchange of social status. Because if the class is interrupted and you come in with a bundle of roses, they're not going equally to every child. Instead, there's like one Robert Pattinson, <laughs> who was not me, who would get all the roses. But what's again very interesting about like the libidinal economy, if you will, to use a very expensive term. <laughs> is that if somebody gets all the roses, it simply means that all the girls are crushing on that guy, <laughs> or vice versa. It's an embarrassment of riches. It doesn't really mean anything. But there was always one person who would get one rose. And when you get one rose, that's very potent, because mm -hmm. then you know that there's one person out there who wants to show you their affection. The crucial detail here is that the roses were anonymous. Mm. And so if you received the rose for Valentine's, you spent the rest of the week trying to suss out <laughs> who had sent you the roses. Now, of course, there was a message attached to the rose. Mm. So there was a message that you could use as a clue. This is already, we're in the, we're in the realm of not just Valentine, right? <laughs> we're already in the realm of surplus enjoyment. Of course, guys being guys, we would simply write fake roses to each other. <laughs> Because at the end of the day, homosexual love is the best kind of love when it comes to when it comes to masking your insecurities about not receiving a rose. Um, anyway, okay, so that 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 sort of but I mean, speaking of like um, commodities, mm -hmm. um, when I was younger, I still think of myself as young, but when I was younger, I traveled in Japan. And there's something really curious in Japan, something that caught my eye that I find fascinating. I mean, everything is fascinating mm -hmm. in Japan to me. But at Japanese restaurants, there is a practice where in the window display in a Japanese restaurant, they have a model, like a handmade fake version. Like of a the, ceramic replica. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of the meal that you are about to consume. And what I, what, this is already interesting, but not like particularly interesting. What I thought was so interesting was that depending on how good the model of the food looked, depending on how good the fake food looked, you had a pretty realistic idea of how good the actual food would be. Now, of course, this goes completely against what we usually think of with advertising. When it comes to advertising, we think that we make something look better than it actually is. 
for example, um, an advertisement for a hamburger, when you go to actual McDonald's and Burger King, the hamburger isn't that big. It's really small, but on TV, it looks like this big <laughs> and juicy. And so we become accustomed to the fact that our advertisement for something embellishes the reality of what it is, that it gives us the fantasy version of what the thing actually is, and that it will always disappoint. Within our society, we've become accustomed to the idea that reality bites, that reality is disappointing, that reality will never live up to the fantasy. And in a weird way, it's comforting almost because we can have this ideal hamburger on television, but we don't really feel robbed when we get the imperfect copy of it at the restaurant. You would be, a sign of a crazy person would be someone who would go to the counter at McDonald's and say, look at this picture. <laughs> Why is my hamburger not looking like this picture? We've all sort of internalized the fact that the true thing won't live up to the ideal. But not so in Japan. In Japan, it's very different. I mean, of course, they also have advertisements. But when it comes to the restaurant, the quality of the fake, the quality of the model of the food gives you a pretty good indicator as to what the actual food is like. Well, and I think what you're pointing out is that in TV advertising, there's sort of a standardization of what food is supposed to look like. Whereas in Japan, there's still a range in the quality of models. So it's not that restaurants are all trying to buy the highest quality of models to, to try to say that they're a better restaurant maybe than they actually are. There's truth in advertising to some degree. Yes and no, maybe. Mm. Because I was interested in this just as you are, mm -hmm. which is, is there truth in advertising? Are the Japanese simply more honest about the quality <laughs> of their food? And I, I, I was very suspicious. I thought that can't be true. But instead, as it turns out, the reason this, this again, libidinal economy works in which we have the fake model that actually represents the thing is that the manufacturers of the models keep a very, very restrictive manufacturing policy. In other words, it's really expensive to buy the model. <laughs> and so if you're running a shop that doesn't have the money to invest in expensive ingredients in high quality cooking, you can't buy one of the expensive models. Mm. And so it's almost worse than the American dream, <laughs> which is that the reality is contained in the model. If you have a poorly looking model, it says, I don't have enough money to invest in the model. And so the higher end restaurants have really expensive fakes and the cheaper ones have really cheap fakes and so there's an honesty to that system but it's an honesty that's conditioned by the relative inequality and access to the dream in other words the fantasy isn't equal the mm -hmm. fantasy is distributed unequally whereas of course the idea here is that the fantasy is distributed equally <laughs> now there's a couple more things to unravel here because we are talking about the nature of the commodity, which means we're talking about the nature between the reality of an object, supposedly, and the fantasy of an object and your subjective relation to it. Um, Zizek points towards the Terry Gilliam movie, Brazil. And Brazil has a scene that's fairly famous in which a character goes to an expensive restaurant and they're presented with images of expensive looking food like a steak, like a really expensive steak. And they have to choose between the images. Now, they're presented with an image, like the picture of the steak, but the actual food is like a, it's like a, just like a gray glob, essentially. Like, and so the idea is here is the mush, the essence of the food, the pulp that the food will inevitably become in your system anyway. And here's the idea of the food. Here's the fantasy image of the food. But what Zizek says, what's, and where Zizek goes a step further, and I think this is very important, Zizek says that the waiter in Brazil insists that the customer make a choice, that the customer express his freedom to choose. Because on the surface, the customer could say, what does it matter what the picture is? After all, I'm just consuming the same glob. You could bring me a picture of a steak or a picture of a salad. It's still just going to be a glob of nothing. But the waiter insists that the customer actualize his choice and, in, in a sense, act on behalf of his own freedom to choose between things that in reality are the same, 
but that in fantasy are presented as different. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting here is that this is traditionally how people thought about consumer society. That's where the critique from Derek Carey Gilliam is coming, which is that we're presented with the illusion of choice. We have many, many different types of things to choose from and between, but we don't get to choose the choice itself. In other words, we don't get to condition the parameters of our own choosing, which means that our freedom to choose happens with the confines of an artificially created consumer society of which we are the consumer base. That's the traditional critique of consumer society. You could walk into, for example, if you go into a fast food chain, whether it's Burger King or McDonald's, they're fundamentally the same, but they're presented to you as being completely different. Right. You, oh yeah, you're yeah. Gonna, no, yeah, and, and and I think that part of the the unacknowledged choice is the choice of um, either having adequate time to have a genuine meal break. Um, or the genuine choice of not having to eat in your car or the genuine choice. Like there are other, let's say, genuine choices that are being masked by this variety of mm -hmm. fast food restaurants. Exactly. We have not a democracy of opportunity, but a democracy of access. The mm -hmm. idea being that if everybody can buy it, then it must be equal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, what ha there's other examples of this. For example, if you go back to the advertisements for the difference between Apple computers and uh, Microsoft computers, or what, mm -hmm. IBM's. PC. PC, thank you, PC, Apple and <laughs> PC. The way in which those advertisements were presented, going all the way back to the 80s and 90s, was to say that if you bought a PC, you were a certain type of person. Mm -hmm. And if you bought an Apple, you were a different type of person. To buy a PC made you a square. You worked in an office, you had no imagination. You were simply an extension of the computer mind. On the other hand, if you bought an Apple computer, you were a creative, someone who was autonomous, their own man, who was using their computer to innovate in the same manner of, I don't know. Einstein. They always Einstein. had like all of these sort of iconic photographs yeah. to reinforce that. Yeah. There was a pretty good advertisement during the Super Bowl yesterday in which they were making fun of the original Apple ad where it says like dream to be great or something. Mm -hmm. And instead of, and it was very pretentious, like black and white, slow mm -hmm. motion. And it said like, uh, I don't know what the slogan was for Apple, something like the innovators or the greats. And here it was like, we praise the lazy. And I had like all these people who identified as being lazy. <laughs> anyway, the point being here is that the way in which Apple marketed itself very successfully, I may say, was to suggest that whether you bought a PC computer or an Apple computer made you a very different type of person. Mm -hmm. In other words, that your consumer choice was an expression of lifestyle. In fact, an expression of your essence that depending on if you choose one computer versus another computer, you are either a creative genius or a, I don't know, a conformist stooge. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is that this actually played into PC's hands as well. Because now you have two different consumer bases. PC gets sold to every office worker around the world, which is a much bigger market share. Mm -hmm. And Apple gets sold to everybody who thinks that they're not an office worker and yet have to do office work. Which is still everybody working in an office. Yeah. Of course, <laughs> yeah. today those boundaries have blended, rightfully so. And what's important here is that, to go back to the image from Brazil, is you're presented with different pictures, different fantasies, but underneath the surface, it's essentially the same thing. And the way in which you are able to get away with that, that abstraction, is by suggesting that the difference isn't between the objects, the difference lies within you. That you are expressing your own identity, that your own essence is expressed through your consumer choice, in other words, through the way in which you adopt a lifestyle. And this is also why the waiter in Terry Gilliam's Brazil insists that the customer make a choice. You have to exert your freedom. And how do you make yourself manifestly free? Mm -hmm. It's by adopting the correct lifestyle. And one of the things that we've seen happen within our politics today is essentially, you could say, the lifestyle of politics 
So we don't just make a choice based on the policies that we approve of. We don't just make a choice based on the politicians we approve of. We choose our politics almost as a form of lifestyle. Our politics become sort of woven into a general fabric of other lifestyle activities, whether it's dietary preferences, whether it's the movies we like, the celebrities we approve of or disapprove of. We catalog our entire life into a sense, into a lifestyle, which means the ability to make the appropriate consumer choices. And so our approach towards politics becomes a similar manifestation. We choose the politician, not who we think is most equipped to be a politician, but the one who most readily fits within our preconceived catalog of what we think of as our identity. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of still very much the traditional critique of consumer society. The problem, I would say, with the 1990s, early 2000s critique of consumer society was this idea that if you simply rejected the fantasy, you could go back to authentic expression. This was epitomized by the no logo movement. The no logo movement believed that the Nike sign or the brand that you wore on your clothing was the epitome of this false consciousness. Mm -hmm. That not only were you wearing a brand, in other words, you were advertising for another company, but you were in a very shallow way expressing your own identity as if it were associated with a brand. And the No Logo movement claimed that if we learned to step away from branding, we could essentially embrace a much more, I don't know, equal society in which brands didn't matter so much. We could go back to the essence of what clothing is or what food is, etc. Well, they thought that that was how you re rejected the forced choice. Yeah. You have to wear something, so you might as well choose something that doesn't have a logo. But and that short circuits it. But one of the things that I believe the No Logo movement didn't see, and this isn't to critique the very well-intentioned nature of it, is that what we're really seeking is surplus enjoyment. Now, from a Lacanian psychoanalytic perspective, surplus enjoyment is the enjoyment of that which isn't in the thing. The enjoyment of that which goes beyond the thing. Remember, when we talked about exchanging roses in class, I said the surplus enjoyment is the libidinal economy of the rose. In other words, the rose should be an expression of I love you. However, if the roses are exchanged in public, then the amount of roses you receive becomes a form of surplus enjoyment. Now, I'm comparing my amount of roses to your amount of roses. And so what I'm secretly enjoying is no longer having a rose. What I'm enjoying is having more roses than you. Mm -hmm. And this is something that happens also with the commodity fetish and with the idea of branding. Part of enjoying having a branded good is that you enjoy the prestige that is momentarily associated with that brand. I don't just have a sweater. I have that which is more in sweater than sweater. And what we crave is the surplus enjoyment. We don't actually crave the garment. This is also why it's fascinating to watch the way in which fashion and, and branding and the surplus enjoyment of fashion and branding can be s secular, uh, what, uh, circular. Yeah. How a brand that for many years would be so distasteful that to wear it would be to like take a bite out of rotten fruit. It's a visceral distaste that many people have <laughs> when they see a brand that they don't like. How that brand can then become rehabilitated over time mm -hmm. to become the most desirable brand. One of the pleasures of aging is that you will witness this process or have witnessed it, how something that is unfashionable becomes fashionable, and if you wait long enough, it will become fashionable again. Now, what was slightly reactionary about the No Logo movement was that it believed that all of this excess, all of this surplus enjoyment was morally suspicious, and that if we could have a kind of capitalism bereft of surplus enjoyment, we could actually have ethical consumption. Mm -hmm. The blind spot within the no logo movement was precisely the surplus enjoyment of the no logo. The way in which no logo didn't mean I don't have a logo. The enjoyment of no logo was I had a logo and I removed it. That was the surplus enjoyment or in a Hegelian sense, a negation of negation. It posited not that you had a clothing piece of clothing that was unbranded. It posited that you had in a world of branding had stepped outside of it. In other words, that your embrace of the no logo 
was a form of resistance. It was a, a, a positive movement towards something else. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because the digital equivalent of this, which you may remember, was that for a while people became, rightfully so, I suppose, paranoid about webcams. And people would put stickers on their webcam to say, I don't want to be watched by the government. Mm -hmm. Of course, nobody actually thinks of themselves that you specifically are being watched by someone. And yet, at the same time, there's a surplus enjoyment in putting a sticker on your <laughs> webcam, especially if then other people can see the sticker. And so that becomes a form of branding, a form of performative practice. I saw someone who had a, a, a fake designer handbag and had taken a sticker and put the sticker over the fake logo of the designer handbag, which I thought was actually very beautiful because it wasn't just saying, here I have an expensive handbag where I'm now pretending I don't care mm -hmm. about it. Here I have a fake expensive handbag, <laughs> but I'm still... I'm denying the significance of, of the logo, yeah. right? And, and of course, this is also what we've talked about. This is the surplus enjoyment of minimalism, mm -hmm. is minimalism isn't just the practice of having less. Minimalism is the active process of creating forms of less and nothingness in your life and embracing a kind of stillness. In a Nietzschean sense, it's not wanting for nothing. It is wanting nothing itself. It is the positivization of a kind of formal emptiness. In other words, this is where we find surplus enjoyment. Surplus enjoyment exists in the realm of what happens after the positive mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. after you take it take it away. You sustain the pleasure beyond the thing itself. We talked in a previous class about how Mary Kondo's approach to minimalism is what sparks joy. You, you look at all the objects that you have and you ask yourself, does this spark joy? If it does, you keep it. If it doesn't, it gets thrown away. From a Lacanian perspective, what truly sparks joy is the surplus joy. In other words, the throwing away. And so you have to appreciate one item around which you have the libidinal economy of enjoying throwing everything else away. And, and you look at people's emotional responses to the throwing away. It's very intense. It's a kind of high and a low and a almost cathartic experience that people get from sort of ex, ex, expunging, expunging mm -hmm. thank you, the objects from their life, a kind of high that they would no longer get through mere consumption. Mm -hmm. And so this is surplus enjoyment. It's not saying it's an enjoyment that is the opposite of consumption. Mm -hmm. It's actually the logical continuation of the consumptive drive beyond the inner limit of consumption itself. Mm -hmm. And this is what Marx means by the commodity fetish. The commodity fetish isn't simply to say that we treat something as more valuable than it actually is. In fact, Marx doesn't believe that there is such a thing as an originary true value. Marx is not a no logoist. Marx doesn't believe that the essence of t-shirt is a t-shirt without a Nike swoosh on it. Instead, what Marx is essentially positing is that this kind of what Lacan would later call surplus enjoyment emerges beyond the product itself. And that what happens is that we start identifying ourselves, our emotions, our, our cathartic processes, not in the object. Because most people aren't actually that shallow. Most people don't actually say, my life's goal is to have Armani jeans. It's what happens beyond that. Mm -hmm. And that's what Marx means when he says that it's not that we treat objects as people and people as objects. It's that the relation between objects becomes structuring of the relations between people. In other words, we're back at the Terry Gilliam scene in Brazil. The man is asked to exert his own individual agency to choose between things that are objectively the same, but different in fantasy. Mm. And so what happens is that your own identity, your own subjective agency in the world, your social relation, as Marx would put it, becomes embodied in the subjective process of choosing between the now very real fantasies. And that is the commodity fetish, the way in which the structural relation between the fantasies structures the relation of your own identity. And so the fundamental misconception from a no logo perspective would be to say that if you strip away the fantasy, you can go back to essence. But again, to go back to Terry Gilliam's imagery, if you got rid of the picture of the steak and the picture of the salad, you would just have the amorphous blob. Mm -hmm. And this is also where from a Freudian Lacanian perspective, neurosis comes in. What the neurotic does is actually to strip away the fantasy too successfully. Mm -hmm. Anything you do in life, if you think about it too much, 
if you take away the fan, the fantasy element breaks down into neurosis. Think about how often you blink while speaking. <laughs> think about swallowing. Think mm-hmm. about breathing. Think about all the things that your body does seem, seemingly autonomously that sustain you in the world. Now, if you started saying everything in the world is a fantasy, we have to go back to the biological reduction of what do I need in order to survive. That's where you become neurotic. You become overly self-aware of what it is that you're doing. Mm-hmm. And so we need fantasy in order to survive. When I was a child, I would go bike riding and I would imagine to myself that I was a biker mouse from Mars. (laughs) Biker mice from Mars, which was a 1980s television series. And I would be on my bicycle and I would be experiencing the world and enjoying it thus the more because I was a biker mouse. And this is one of the key lessons that Zizek also keeps talking about when it comes to virtual reality versus reality. It's not a binary between the virtual and reality. Instead, the virtual allows us to more properly inhabit reality without a kind of breakdown into fantasy. We wouldn't have access to reality. That's the key Lacanian insight that I wrote about a lot in my ebook is that Lacan says that in the division between essence and appearance, between the virtual and reality, that we only access essence through appearance, that we only make sense of the world, we only even live it by means of a kind of extra, a surplus. Yeah, and that's why it's almost as though in the Terry Gilliam um, scene that you mentioned, which I think is absolutely perfect, in a sense, it's like it doesn't have to be like just a pile of mush. It could in fact be two different things. The point is you can't recognize it for what it is until you're presented with the, with the fantasy. The reality is mediated by the fantasy. And that to me sort of parallels and echoes what you're saying about Marx and the relation and the commodity, commodity fetish is that it's all about the relationship between things rather than the thing itself. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, I think Another movie in which we can see almost literally the same imagery, but from a very different perspective, is in the original Matrix. Mm -hmm. The Matrix is very much a movie of its time. It's very much a movie of the anti-consumer, no logo, quite, quite traditional metaphysical approach to you have essence versus illusion. And that if you live in the world of essence, you have the truth. And if you live in the world of illusion, you have the Matrix. You have the blue pill versus the red pill. And the movie advocates living in reality. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene in which, I don't know what his name is, is it Cypher or something? The guy with the goatee? Yeah, I think so. He's being essentially wooed by one of the agents to become a traitor Mm -hmm. to the cause. And he's sitting at a fancy restaurant and he's being served a steak. Mm -hmm. And he cuts into the steak, it's very juicy, and he raises it to his mouth and he says, I know that this steak is fake. I know it's an illusion that I'm in the matrix, that there are electrodes in my brain going off. But what does it really matter? This stake is more real than what I have in the world of truth. And secretly, Cypher is correct. And it's not Cypher. Cypher's the other guy. Yeah. Someone's going to get mad with me. The guy, <laughs> the guy with the goatee and the sunglasses. They all have sunglasses. <laughs> secretly, he's correct. Because when Neo wakes up in the real world, the world of essence, and he's served breakfast, what is the breakfast? It's an amorphous glob mm-hmm. that contains everything you need. And he's told this has... <laughs> You know, it has nutrients and vitamins and protein, and there's nothing here that is extraneous. There's nothing excessive. And here we understand the moralizing economy of the Matrix world of essence, the fundamentalist ethos of it, in which the one thing missing from the food, as one of the characters points out, Mm -hmm. is, of course, the fantasy of the food. What we consume in the food is not the nutrients. What we consume in the food is that which is beyond the food itself. Mm -hmm. The reason we eat it. In other words, for Lacan, it's not the object of desire. What we want is the object cause of desire. Mm -hmm. What we need in order to sustain the real, uh, sorry, not the real, the reality, is the fantasy. And even though the fantasy is technically fake, Mm -hmm. the fantasy is what actualizes the essence of food. You wouldn't eat it unless it was appealing to you. This is also the trap that we find ourselves in with like the sort of uh, tech utopian idea that um, instead of eating culinary cultural practices, we could just have powders. You know, we could just have like a nutrient shake that mm-hmm. we take in three times a day. And of course, the answer is yes, technically, you could probably do that. And at that point, 
what exactly is life anymore? If you've robbed life of its fantasy element and you've boiled it down to simply the, the nutrients, then you're actually in the horrific, abysmal part of life in which life is simply a process of going through the motions from birth to death. Yeah. And this goes back to the idea that Kierkegaard had. It's funny because this is an idea that Kierkegaard had that has been turned into like self-help slogans. <laughs> There's a self-help slogan on the internet, which is like, you'll find all these motivational videos where they say something like, um, what we really fear is that we are limitless or something <laughs> like that. But what Kierkegaard meant was that Kierkegaard said that being a finite agent in the world, a finite human being, isn't nearly as terrifying as the idea that you are immortal. Mm -hmm. Now, what he means is not that you will live forever. What he means is that all of your desires are earthly desires. They're finite. They're all conditioned by your being in the world. Mm -hmm. Nothing is made to last. This is what we talk about with fashion. Fashion comes around. When you get older and you realize how things go in and out of fashion, it, it makes you realize that this will continue forever, <laughs> essentially. And, and the opposite, of course, is if you boil everything down to simple utility, to simple, I'm drinking a protein shake and I'm wearing the same t-shirt for the rest of my life, mm -hmm. That's when you get into the realm of the infinite, the realm of the immortal, in which you're in a much more dangerous, more abysmal, nihilistic, even absurdist mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what Kierkegaard realizes, is that what, what is terrifying about life is not that it's finite. It's not that it's fleeting and passing. We may think that's terrifying, but actually that's what gives us access to everything that might, makes life worth living. Mm -hmm. What makes us terrified is the idea of eternal repetition. Mm -hmm the idea that everything is simply the same. And so, of course, we introduce fantasy. Technically, every time you eat, even breakfast, lunch, and dinner, there's no real reason why breakfast, lunch, and dinner should be such different <laughs> meals. We have an entire identity around breakfast, lunch, and dinner. There are foods that are breakfast foods <laughs> and not breakfast foods. Somehow, mysteriously, a slice of pizza can be both a dinner food, a breakfast food, and a lunch food. It's like it surpassed the boundaries of how we mm -hmm. eat. And yet that entire process isn't simply lifestyle. It's not simply a false choice. Mm -hmm. It is the very condition of freedom itself. The fact that you are filling in what is otherwise the empty space of human repetition. And can I briefly get back to yeah. what you were talking about with um, with ethical consumption? Because I think that it's worth pointing out that there's a very big difference between ethical consumption and radical consumption. And so the question for Marx is, what makes something radical? And it wouldn't be to say, oh, if only things were fair trade and, you know, the farmers were getting the proper value of something, then capitalism would be short-circuited and everything would be fine. For Marx, the question is, what makes it radical? And you can see a perfect illustration of this in the policies of Starbucks. Starbucks pioneered, I mean, pioneered, this idea of, you know, we're going to have a fair trade coffee, we're going to, you know, if you want to buy organic coffee, if you want to, you know, support the, the farmers who are growing these beans, you know, you can pay extra and feel less guilty about your coffee. The radical move isn't fair trade coffee. Not that that isn't important. The radical move is for Starbucks employees to be unionized. And that's where Starbucks fights back. And that's where you can see the difference between ethical consumption and radical consumption or radical mm -hmm. relationship. It's true. And what I want to add to that, though, yeah. which is that if we're talking about lifestyle, being pro-union mm. has also become a little bit of a lifestyle, which is that <laughs> yeah. there's many people that uh, we'll talk to mm who have quite up-to-date opinions on is Amazon, are mm -hmm. Amazon workers in Chicago mm -hmm. or something unionizing mm -hmm. or here? And it's sort of like we support it. And of course, one should support unionizing efforts. I very much believe this. I've been part of union efforts at the universities that I've worked at. Um, and trust me, it is not fun to fight on the losing side <laughs> over and over again. Um, I do very much believe that. But of course, the way in which we now consume union narratives through mm -hmm. left-wing or liberal media, progressive media. progressive media has become itself kind of like part mm -hmm. of that whole lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But I don't mm -hmm. want to like yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah. But I wanted to distinguish between like ethical consumption and like yeah. what is genuinely radical. And that's what you're saying there is super important, mm -hmm. right? Because the idea, and this is actually where Zizek is going to come back in. Mm -hmm. Because ethical consumption today gives us a key as to what has happened within the consumer economy. 
which is that the critique of the no logo movement was why does everybody want more? Mm -hmm. Why does everybody want more brands? Why are we just walking around with empty value? Of course, for Marx, all value is empty. There's no a priori urgrund of value. When it comes to ethical consumption, we've found a shift, which is again, the internal limit of capitalism in a sense, gorging upon its own emptiness, which is that now we buy things not for what they are, we buy things for what they are not. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you're having ethical consumer choices like fair trade, you're buying them because they're not supposed to be exploitative. They're supposed to be exempt from capitalism within the capitalist consumer economy. Mm -hmm. The same is true when you buy something that has no sugar. You say, well, sugar is bad, so now I'm going to buy a candy bar without sugar. Mm -hmm. And Zizek simply takes that idea of where you don't want the essence of the thing, but you want that which it has been supposedly deprived of. And he extends that to our society at large. He says that increasingly that's how we think of as love. We want love without consequences. We want love without danger. We want love that can be fleeting, in which you can just meet somebody else every night. Mm -hmm. We want to have sexual encounters that increasingly don't even require our own <laughs> participation. In other words, how pornography becomes increasingly mm -hmm. dominant. Zizek says that for him, the ultimate romantic encounter would be one in which he and a woman go on a date, they go home, and they both get out a sex toy, <laughs> two vibrators. They plug in the vibrators into the socket. They leave the vibrators in the room, and they go out and read books together. He says, like, this is the ultimate romantic Valentine's for him, is that someone else or something else does the screwing so he can go and have the romantic time. Of course, this isn't to blame anybody or to say that anybody is doing something wrong or to have a moralizing economy, but it's that in our very freedom to treat our life as a consumer's practice, mm -hmm. to freely choose between as many partners as we want, We've lost something. We've lost a certain kind of essence of what it means to actually spend time with that person. Mm -hmm. and, and this isn't to say, oh, we should go back to that because that's the ultimate fundamental reactionary mistake to think that there was an essence to begin with. Now, when it comes to this whole idea of wanting something that has been deprived of its essence, this is also how we can see how surplus enjoyment persists. It's like a zombie type of enjoyment. For example... If you are a vegan, part of the enjoyment of being vegan is that it provides you with a plethora of surplus enjoyment. On the level of what Lacan would call the big other, you can enjoy the fact that you're doing something good for the planet. In other words, you're opting out of destructive agricultural policies and practices. So that is a good thing you're doing. You could say to yourself that as a vegan, you're also doing something good for your body, which is another form in the sense of the big other, the ideal form of you. You're doing something that's not clotting your arteries, etc. As a vegan, you could also say that you make friends and you become part of a community of other vegans. Or you could even say that part of the surplus enjoyment of a vegan is that you get to antagonize people who are not sufficiently vegan. This is like a whole part of vegan culture as well, right? The, the battles that rage between vegans are not unlike the battles between like... I don't know, like Trotskyist, <laughs> left wing, like it's like right, the, we no the, longer fight about religion; we just fight about diet. Yeah, exactly. The the whole and and what I'm trying to say here is I'm not trying to mock being a vegan. I think in many ways being a vegan is is a very good thing to do, but it provides you with a couple of different surplus enjoyments, and those things are unlocked precisely by opting out of dairy and and meat mm -hmm. and whatever. Now. Here we have to mention something from Lacan that I think is very important. Lacan says that the big other doesn't exist. Lacan says that the big other may feel real to you, but it's crucial that the big other doesn't exist. For example, part of what's enjoyable about being a vegan is that you feel like you're making the world a better place or you're fighting capitalism or something, but you also know you're not really. Like, I really don't think that there's a lot of people who genuinely, fundamentally believe that by opting out of these consumptive practices, that will change. That doesn't make them bad people. Mm -hmm. It's just that the big other doesn't really exist. It's not that someone says, I will only become a vegan if you can prove to me that after X amount of days of being a vegan, the world will change. No, we do it anyway. In the same way that the big other doesn't require proof as such. 
if you if you think about God, for example, and belief in God, um, Zizek has this uh, thing where he was in the United States and he saw a church, and they had as their slogan, "We don't believe in God. We know God." Hmm. And Zizek says that here we have the fundamental workings of ideology, which is that the unstated message is not we don't believe in God, we know God. It's we believe we know God. Mm -hmm. In other words, that that which cannot be objectively known, God, is posited as a rational empirical knowledge predicated on a disavowed belief. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to like veganism or any kind of other ideological uh, practice, and, and for those who are joining for the first time, I'm not saying that some things are ideological and some things aren't. I'm saying that the very frame by which we enter and experience reality is ideological. You could say, it's not that I believe that veganism will save the world. I know veganism will save the world. In other words, I believe I know it will. And that that process is the process of all ideological participation. It's saying that what you're objectively positing as true can only be actualized through a certain kind of belief. And of course, there is a kernel of truth to this. If everybody collectively decided to believe that they know that the world will change, the world would change. Mm -hmm. And yet what's happened within capitalism is that the belief that you know, the surplus enjoyment of your own opting out has been cast out into a million different corners. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks that their own little consumptive practice is a part of resistance. Mm -hmm. Whether you're into hunting as a means of authentic collection of food, whether you're into veganism, whether you're into ethical fashion, like everything has its own little niche by which the entire universal is sustained. Mm -hmm. And this is again what from a Marxist perspective would be referred to as false consciousness. It's because everybody thinks that in their own way they are part of the resistance, that there is no resistance. And the classic Marxist quote is that it's the idea of like, for they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. Which of course, here I'm actually quoting the biblical version of it, <laughs> for they know not what they do. Remember Christ says, God don't be mad, for they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. For Marx it's, they don't know what they do and that's why they do it. Mm -hmm. Zizek simply takes the two and reverses it. Zizek says, it's precisely because people know what they do that they do it anyway. Mm -hmm. In other words, I don't believe in God, I know God. It's that knowledge, the idea of a positing of an objective reality is sustained through the frame of fantasy. In other words, that what you're choosing is not between different things, but between different fantasies. And that's how you enter and enjoy the world. Joanne Didion has a quote. Joanne Didion says that Hollywood is the dictatorship of good intentions. Now, of course, there's a little bit of a play on words here because in a sense, all um, all dictatorships are of good intentions. This is actually, this is the idea that goes, but this is a quote from Marx that's not often attributed to Marx, mm -hmm. which is the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Mm -hmm. This is a very common thing and most people don't <laughs> attribute it to Marx. I'm pretty convinced Marx is actually the one who, who first wrote it. And so what's important to note here, because we're talking about the commodity fetish and the fact that Lacan says that the big other doesn't exist. This is where Zizek's take on Marx takes on a different twist. Zizek says that when Lacan said that the big other doesn't exist, we should change that. We should say that in today's world, it's precisely that the big other does exist. What do I mean by that? Well, <clears throat> for example, if you're on TikTok or on Instagram, but even more so on TikTok, then you know that there exists an algorithm that in some ways appears to know you more and better than you know yourself. In other words, that when you go onto TikTok's For You page, what you see is for you. And there's all these videos on TikTok of people saying, I didn't know I was gay. I didn't know I was this. I didn't know I had this problem until the For You page revealed it to me. <laughs> now, of course, what's beautiful here is that on one level, nobody actually believes that the For You page is someone who, like some overarching <laughs> puppet agent who says, yes, Julian, today I will send you a message with homoerotic undertones <laughs> to reveal to you your true nature. No one believes that. On the other hand, it feels like it is because increasingly the way in which we participate on the internet is being constantly cataloged and registered mm -hmm. for profit. And that is being refracted back to us as our true self that we don't know yet. And so we've merged into this new economy, which in a sense is much more true to the idea of the commodity fetish, in which 
no logo would have no impact. Mm. There's no way that you would say, now I'm an ethical consumer or I don't do branding. It's that your very identity is presented to you as somehow hidden and revealed through the consumptive process of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. That the algorithm contains the essence of you that is now being revealed to you. And so we found ourselves caught in this feedback loop of 21st century consciousness, and we are just at the very beginning of it. We are fundamentally unaware and ill-prepared for the manner in which the very idea of human consciousness and subjectivity is going to undergo a fundamental shift mm -hmm. in the future as our consciousness doesn't blend into the metaverse mm -hmm. because that's the problem of the metaverse. It's not here you have reality and here you have virtual reality. It's that the very way in which we understand our reality, our essence, our subjective core of our being is in a sense revealed to us through the undercurrents of the truth coming refracted back at us but through so the algorithm. Yeah, no, that's super important. And we're just at the very beginning of this, my mm -hmm. friends. Like, honestly, this is this is something we have to think about. Well, and I think you can really see the difference in different platforms, uh, the significance in how the algorithm functions on different platforms. Like, I think that Netflix, I mean, a lot of people's <laughs> Uh, ambivalence about using Netflix is I want to watch something but I don't really know what I want to watch and when they're confronted with this is what we think you'd like based on your viewing preferences I think some people are horrified like I don't want to be the person who watches this kind of thing whereas I think TikTok and other social media algorithms have figured out this is what you think you want to be mm -hmm. and so we're gonna say this is for you because it matches your aspirations about who you think you are so it's not even this is who you are this is the fantasy of who you think you are yeah I, I personally believe that the TikTok for you page has immense philosophical importance mm -hmm. because the model of our consumer society used to be that you were presented with a plethora of choices between things that were fundamentally the same and that you exerted your own autonomous free agency by choosing between them. <clears throat> For example, I know that if I'm going to buy a computer, I will buy a Mac and not a PC. If I'm going to buy speakers or any, any kind of like luxury product, it's very important to me that I buy the right camera or the right monitor. This is what traditionally would have been called bourgeois ideology. It's that you know everything you need to know to express your good taste by means of your consumer practices. Mm -hmm. This model by which your agency is choosing between things that are more or less the same but presented differently, the model of lifestyle, is being completely inverted and turned on its head, where now the content is being dished up to you. The content is finding you. The content is being sort of like embedded within you as if it were your own subjective mm -hmm. choice. And so the illusion that we used to have, which is the illusion of free choice within that which is the same, is now being presented to us as the illusion of not having had to choose at all. This was made for you. And so if we go back to the image of the Terry Gilliam's Brazil, instead of saying here are different pictures of food in which you have blobs that are could be a steak or a salad, it's saying here is one steak and this steak was made only for you. Nobody else gets to eat the steak. This steak contains everything you were put on this planet to do. This is The steak is the icon of your own actualization. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think I'm being like overly modern, like hyperbolic here, all you have to do is go back to the trial and the, the, the parable within Kafka of the man who spends his entire life waiting in front of the gate, the gate that is close to him, the gate behind which is supposed to be justice, and it's only when he's dying in front of the gate, having expired his life energy waiting, that the guardsman at the gate whispers in his ear, this gate was only made for you. That is the era that we're going into now, the properly existentialist era, in which we perceive mass consumption as being made only for us. And that kind of claustrophobic world is something that we're going to have to figure out to think and to mediate. And it's the challenge of any kind of leftist, radical philosophy, theorist, thinker, to think not the confines of the world that came before, but to think the moment that you are in. And that's the challenge, is to think the world as it is emerging within the present. That is ultimately what the practice of theory is. It's not to say, here's what we know about the past, or here's what we anticipate about the future. 
It's how the future is already embedded within the present based on its response to the past. And so it would be fundamentally dishonest and I think useless to teach a class about Zizek and the commodity fetish talking about 1990s and 2000s consumptive practices. Instead, the purpose of this class has been to take some of those principles from Lacan and Marx and Zizek and to show you the way in which they can be applied towards thinking about the future, the future that is already in the present and is unfolding right now. And that is the excitement of thought in action. That is the promise and the ideal of thinking and theorizing the world around you because it makes you feel less subject to it. It makes you feel like you are not just the passive recipient of a culture that is out of control, nor does it promise you that you are the true resistance to it. There's no moment in any of these classes that I will tell you that you are the privileged, exempt group who are somehow better than everybody else. That will never happen. Instead, I think that the best way to live is to allow yourself to be attuned to the way the world is changing around you and to have the critical capacity and the intellectual conceptual framework to try to make sense of that which is exceeding our grasp. That is what I believe. On that note, happy Valentine's Day. (laughs) Thank you so much for starting this week with us. It's been our pleasure. Thank you to Jeline for editing the transcripts. Absolutely. That is a monumental amount of work and a true expression of love. Thank you so much. We will be uh, hosting a live discussion where we will take your questions for Mm -hmm. another 30 minutes or so. That's going to start on Discord in five minutes. Mm. Very quickly. We love doing this. Mm. We'd like to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. If you've enjoyed these classes, if you'd like to be part of our learning community, if you'd like Mm -hmm. to keep helping us, I don't know, do what we love. Mm -hmm. Please consider becoming a patron. You can access our ebook that gives you summaries of the concepts, Mm -hmm. introductions. Um, gives you access to our classes as downloads, gives you access to our Discord community. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to be, if you'd like to go all the way (laughs) with our learning community, please consider becoming a patron today. Mm -hmm. It starts at just $5 a month, and it really does help. It helps us with this project. So thank you so much. Sending love to all of you on this Valentine's Day. Yes. And um, we'll see you in five minutes (laughs) on Discord. Take care, everyone. Have a great week. Bye-bye.